expect to preach with reference to things going on today. So if you will turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 3, we're going to read the first 15 verses of Isaiah 3, but we're going to start with Isaiah 2, verse 22. And the title of the sermon is, How Do We Know That America Is Under the Judgment of Almighty God? So let us stand out of reverence for the reading of the Word of God. Isaiah 2, 22 through Isaiah 3, 15. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nose. For why should he be esteemed? For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread, the whole supply of water, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter. And I will make mere lads their princes, and capricious children will rule over them. And the people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder, and the inferior against the honorable. When a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge. On that day... He will protest, saying, I will not be your healer. For in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me ruler of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled, and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their actions are against the Lord, to rebel against his glorious presence. The expression of their faces bears witness against them, and they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. O oh, my people, their oppressors are children, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. You may be seated. This week's been a roller coaster, hasn't it? The ride's not over yet. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Now, what's behind all this? We're thinking as Christians. We're not thinking as Democrats or Republicans or humanists. We're thinking as Christians. What's behind all this acceleration in violence and uh, the uh, transformation of America into something it wasn't intended to be? the long-standing and increasing apostasy and compromise of the church has caused this nation to be under the severe judgment of Almighty God. How do we know that? We know that because that's what chapter 3 is about. 
Look how chapter 2 ends. And we'll come back and quote some verses from chapter 1 and 2. Verse 22 literally says, Cease from man. Cease from man. Stop regarding man. Quit putting your confidence in man. Quit looking to man to be your savior and your hope. Any man. His breath is in his nostrils. That's all he is. And why should you esteem man anyway? Why should you put your hope and your faith and your confidence in him to get you out of all the problems of, life, of this life? Why should man be esteemed at all? Notice how chapter 3 begins. For, because, here's what God's going to do in a culture to a church and to the society in which that church lives that turns its back on him. There's a principle that I've laid down over and over and over. Don't forget it. And that is, don't, don't blame the Democrats as bad as they are. Don't blame the Republicans as bad as they are. Don't blame the communists as bad as they are. It's the church that has led us to the judgment of God. What does it say in one of the epistles? It says judgment begins with the house of God. It's not what it says in Greek. It says judgment begins from the house of God into the society in which that church exists. So the spiritual condition of the church determines the political, economic, social condition of the society in which that church exists. God not only destroyed the church in Israel and Judah because of its long-standing apostasy, it destroyed the nations in which they lived. These things came literally true. 721 B.C., the Assyrians come and wipe out the northern kingdom of Israel, just like this says. The southern kingdom of Judah that was supposed to be so faithful, a few hundred years later, 586 B.C., God sends the Babylonians and wipes out the country of Judah. 70 A.D., Judah was still somewhat in existence, still apostate. God sends the Roman armies to devastate Jerusalem and Judah. So, these things literally came true. This is mythology. And these things happen to the church and the society in which that church exists any time the church fails to repent of her apostasy. Apostasy means to one at one time love, uh, profess to love God, but now you've turned your back on him and defiantly refuse to live for him. America, the, the church in America is apostate. Compromised, there's a few faithful churches, but apostate. And so the nation in which we live is apostate. So here's what God does when he judges apostate churches and societies. First of all, for behold the Lord God of hosts. Pay close attention to this. Behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. It happened. God removed from Jerusalem and Judah in 586 with the Babylonians, later with the Romans in 70 AD, everything they depended upon for life. 70 A.D., there was cannibalism. People were eating their babies. They were selling their babies to other people to eat. That God removed from this apostate culture everything it depended upon for the sustaining of life. And don't think America's above all of it. I mean, we've had... Uh, Depressions, how many wars in our history? How many pandemics in our history? 
How many riots in our history? How many departures from freedom and perversion of justice? God removes everything an apostate nation depends upon for life. So that it has to fall flat on its face and hopefully cry out to the living God. All of its cisterns for holding water are broken cisterns. They hold no water. And as long as they leave the Lord God Almighty and turn to other gods, God will remove everything that the nation depends upon. You say, well, we're not going to have a famine. Well, there's more than one way to uh, have your food removed. You can have the, your food removed by famine. You can have your food removed by status control of agriculture that destroys agriculture. Or you can have genetically modified, modified vegetables so that the vegetables are there, but the nutrients are gone. When you go to the store, do you go look for the biggest and most beautiful piece of yellow corn? All the rows are orderly. It's not old. It just looks so juicy and you want to bite into it. Has hardly any nutrients compared to that little teeny piece of corn that you're not going to buy that is not modified by science. So God says, you turn from me, I'm going to turn from you. I want you to learn that I'm not going to sustain an evil lifestyle. And then he says this, and not only that, but I'm going to remove, verse 2, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter. And I will make mere lads your princes, and capricious children will rule over them, and the people will be oppressed. I'm going to move effect remove effective leadership from your country, from your church, from the session, from the pulpit. Have you ever noticed how many preachers today are preaching something that's not to be found in the Word of God? Most of them, to one degree or another. And politicians. He says, I'm removing effective politicians. I'm, a, I'm moving, removing effective leadership in church and state. Because effective leadership is a gift of God. A well-regulated state and a well-regulated church is a gift of God. And God says, I'm holding off on my gifts. So that you will not think that I'm condoning your evil lifestyle. And so I'm going to remove effective leadership militarily from the church, from politics, from artisans, even bad leaders, diviners and enchanters. I'm going to remove all effective leaders, good and bad. And then there'll be anarchy. And in their place, verse 4, I will make immature people their princes, capricious, irresponsible, reckless, immature people will rule over them who have no regard for the welfare and the liberty and the justice of the people committed to their charge, but who are only concerned with extending their own power and feathering their own nests. You know, you know anybody like that? Anybody this week? Do you know any, anybody? I mean, do you know anybody in the United States Senate? Or anybody in the United States House of Representatives? Or, or, or anybody in place of power that God's not in the midst of removing and replacing with irresponsible people who have no love of our heritage, no love for you. That's one of the most obvious ways we know that God, America's under judgment. They will be oppressed. 
each one, verse six, 5, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. A lot of violence, a lot of conflict, a lot of envy, a lot of struggle, a lot of frustration. People doing things to each other they ought not to do, jealous of each other, angry with each other, frustrated with each other. Wanting to use violence to get their way and impose their agenda. By the way, you know, in a world, postmodern world where there are no absolutes, politics is just about power. It's all about power. They're not saying, we're going to do this today because this is what God wants us to do. We got the power to do it, so we're going to do it. Now, to me, here's the scariest sentence in the whole chapter. And the people will be oppressed, each one by another and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. So somebody that's inferior pathetic character, pathetic person, self-worshipping person, adulterous person, arrogant person, will give no respect whatsoever to those to whom respect is due. He'll burn down their businesses. He'll tear down their monuments. He'll vandalize their capital. But here's the sentence. The youth will storm against the elder. Now get that picture in your mind and why is it the scariest? That is saying to you and me that when God judges a land, the present generation hates the heritage of its fathers, and seeks to destroy it. You ever seen anything like that? How many people have I heard that have said, uh, with re reference to Supreme Court appointments, that if a man believes in the traditional view of marriage of one man and one woman, he should never be allowed in a courtroom or in any public hall. It's a bigoted, perverted Thing to believe that marriage is only between one man and one woman. Forget your heritage. Your heritage has gotten us where we are in the first place. It's just full of oppression, critical race theory. America was formed in oppression and slavery and racism, and that has colored and jaundiced everything about our life. That's not true, by the way. Sometimes on Saturday, when Ambrielle is taking care of her children, there are these uh, black ladies that help me. And uh, I talk to every one of them about the 1619 Project, sponsored by the New York Times. You know what that is? That is the, the uh, organization that says that America in 1619 in Jamestown fostered slavery, racial slavery, and that's been the heart of everything America has stood for ever since, is racial slavery, and therefore America needs to give reparations to all descendants of slaves. And so I tell these ladies, gently but firmly, I've been lecturing on 1619 for 30 years. And what the New York Times is telling you about 1619 is all a lie. And I wish I had time to get sidetracked right now. And I'll tell you about 1619. It's a great and glorious story. It's not about slavery. It's about Africans that were brought here by Spanish people to be sold to Mexico as slaves, and the Jamestown men get their boats 
and get these first 20 Africans in English North America. And they intermarry with the English and the Indians. And they become indentured servants where they uh, sell themselves to a tobacco farmer for a certain amount of time, a certain amount of money. And then when they've served their time and made their money, they buy their own tobacco farms. One of their descendants was a general under George Washington. And today, of various colors, there are their descendants all over America, and their story is a great one. Read The Birth of Black America. And you'll see that everything that the New York Times tells you about 1619 in Jamestown is a lie. And then I tell these ladies, you know, I knew a slave once. I knew a woman in the early middle 60s who was about 100 years old, and she was born in southern slavery. And her parents and her grandparents on back were slaves in the south. She lived in a one-room house. I told you I wasn't going to get this sidetracked, right? She lived in a one-room house. She burned coal in the fireplace. She kept a shotgun by her bed. And she and her ancestors have been slaves on the Stewart Ranch, which is the large to this day, the largest cattle ranch east of the Mississippi in southwest Virginia. Her name was Miss Stewart. Said, Miss Stewart, I don't want to offend you, but since your name's Stewart and you were a slave on the Stewart Ranch, do you have any Stewart blood in you? She said, oh, no. We were just proud to be Mr. Stewart's slaves. Here's the rest of the story. <laughs> Miss Stewart was white. New York Times didn't say anything about that. The point is, quit listening to all of these liars in media and politi politics that are going to feed you lies and take advantage of the fact that most of us went to public schools and take advantage of our ignorance to confuse us and to lead us to feel guilty about what we believe and what we do, so we'll do what they tell us to do. They want us to uh, reject our heritage, particularly you Southerners. Reject your, heresy, uh, your, your heritage. America founded as a Christian nation. It's all a lie, they tell us. The youth rises up against the elder and the aged. Forget your history. See, if you can be cut loose from your history, they got you. Problem is, most of the people on our side don't know our history. They're already cut loose. But anyway, when God cut, uh, judges a culture, he puts irresponsible people in the place of responsible people. He uh, causes the youth to storm against the elder. He causes inferior people to disrespect those who deserve respect and honorable treatment. Verse 6, When a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge. That's how pathetic things are. They don't look for men that are qualified to be in places of leadership. They quit doing that. Hey, you look like you got a lot of money. You got a good-looking suit. You got a good-looking tie. Why don't you run for office? By the way, when I ran for the United States Congress, I learned statistically that a lot of people vote for you if they like your tie or your haircut. Uh, if they don't, they won't vote for you. So my staff told me what color ties to wear, and he said, now, you don't ever want to wear an orange tie. Most people don't like orange ties. But anyway, so the point is, that's what they're doing there. You got a tie. You got a cloak. Why don't you be our, our, our pastor? Why don't you be our president? Be our, our politician. Doesn't matter how whether you're qualified or not. And then this, here's what the guy says. Verse 7. On that day, he will protest, saying, I will not be your healer. For in my house, there's neither bread nor cloak. You shall not appoint me ruler of the people. Even those who have just a modicum of qualification, 
a little better dressed, a little better job, even those people say, I don't want to be responsible for what's happening. I don't want to be connected. I don't want to be a part of the leadership. Verse 8. Here's why all this is happening. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen. I don't like real life movies. I don't want to have to pay to see real life. I like uh, science fiction movies. I like movies where all the bad guys get killed real good. And so two of my favorite movies are London Has Fallen and Olympic, Olympia Has Fallen. And by means of computer, the special effects are unbelievable. London Has Fallen, you see all these historical sites like Westminster Assembly uh, 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 Abbey destroyed with bombs, all the great places destroyed by bombs as the terrorists take over London. <laughs> Olympia's fallen it's about Washington, D.C., and there the White House is blown up, and the Capitol's blown up, and, and the terrorists take over Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, London has fallen. Olympia has fallen. Fairy tale. Just a game. America has fallen. Is not a movie. It's not a fairy tale. And she didn't fall last week. She's been falling morally and spiritually at least since the middle of the 1800s. And now, as a result of this moral falling of America for the past 150 years, we see her really falling in riots, rebellion, People saying things as politicians or preachers blatantly and openly that people wouldn't say in secret when I was growing up. And here, what's sad about this, Jerusalem was the capital of the, of the ancient theocracy. Judah was comprised of God's covenant people. And so for Isaiah to say, Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, is to say there was only one place in all the world where salvation could be found. And that was in Jerusalem and Judah. And they've fallen. Because, why did they fall? Verse 8. Because their speech and their actions are against the Lord, everything they said, everything they did was contrary to the to the revealed will of Almighty God. All their speeches, all their advice, all their recommendations, all their legislations, all their laws, all of their forms of self-expression, everything they said was contrary to the revealed will of God, and every all of their actions were in violation of the revealed will of God. Don't listen to the mainstream news, particularly if you're easily influenced. These guys were smart. That are better trained than you and me in communication. So if you're easily influenced by some sharp guy up there with facts, facts and figures, don't watch, don't listen, CNN, all, all these others. I'm telling you this. Because I know Christians that still listen to them and they still believe what they see on television. Don't believe what the politicians say. None of the Democrats and most of the Republicans don't believe what they tell you. They're not going to tell you the truth. Just like in the days of Isaiah. Everything they said, all of their actions, were contrary to and against the will of God. Two, look at the last sentence. It's better in Hebrew. To rebel against His glorious presence in Hebrew to rebel against the glory of his eyes. Have you noticed how blatant people are today? I mean, there were still sinners when I was uh, a boy. But they kept it in secret. They did it after dark. Now, it's, and I can remember my graduation night. Everybody stayed up all night long. I stayed up all night long. 
The worst I ever saw anybody do was drink a can of beer and act drunk. No drugs. Still sitting in the heart. Today it's blatant. Homosexuals are blatant. They're blatant in their stand against God, and they're blatant in their stand for whatever they believe. They are in the face of God's glorious eyes. God sees them. They know God sees them. They don't care. Verse 9. Oh, how true is this? The expression of their faces bears witness against them. Now, you can't always tell a person's character by what's on his face, but often the character is reflected in his face and his countenance. And it says these people who are rebelling against the glory of God's eyes, you can see it in their faces. I mean, have you, have you watched people out there, Antifa, Black Lives Matter? The racist, all these other things. Have you seen the look on their faces? They're mad. They're full of hatred and bitterness, fear and frustration. You can look at their faces if you can see it behind all the tattoos and piercings and everything. You look that you can see in their faces. They're in rebellion against God. As many of you know, I used to go to South Africa a lot, and I would preach to the Zulus, which is a great uh, a race of people. And my interpreter was a man named Fano Simbizi. And Fano knew eight European languages. Uh, and he came to me, he was a Zulu, and stayed with me for a while. And he said, Joe, I, I want to go to inner city Atlanta. Now the Zulus are gorgeously black. Black, velvety, purplish skin. And uh, Fano said, Joe, I want to go to inner city Atlanta, see some of these American black people I read about. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll go with you. So we get on Martin, we go down, get off around the Coca-Cola thing. He's there 15 minutes and wants to leave. He said, Joe, I'm scared to death. I have never seen Black people as angry in their faces as I've seen today. That's not just black people. You can see it in people's faces. Here's another condemning thing. You see their rebellion in their faces. Their faces bear witness against them. And they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Now, Isaiah could have said any city in the world. He could have talked about Assyrian cities. They were all wicked. They'd fit the bill. He could talk about all these various other pagan cities with all their evil and immorality and perversion. He didn't. He chose Sodom. He said, these people in this once holy nation just display their sins like they did at Sodom. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah were the two great homosexual cultures in the ancient world. Vast metropolitan place. And God sent fire and brimstone miraculously from heaven and burned up this metropolitan area of probably hundreds of thousands of people. Killed them all, men, women, and children. Because they condoned and practiced and encouraged homosexuality. And God says now to this holy nation, you're acting like Sodom. You're no different from Sodom. You're just as perverted as Sodom. You're probably practicing the same thing Sodom practiced. You display it. You want everybody to know it and see it. You have it on your signs. You have your gay pride weeks. You have all these other things where you want the world to know that you're a homosexual. And I'm going to tell you one way that you can judge yourself to see whether or not you've been influenced by this evil age. If you ever call a homosexual pervert 
a gay person, you are telling the world, I have been influenced by evil. You're using words they want you to use. Look up the dictionary. See what gay means. It's a great word. They're not gay. They're perverts. The Bible calls them dogs. They get no respect from the living God. The Bible says that a culture that condones homosexuality uh, is a, 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 a Romans one is a society and culture abandoned by God. And we live in a culture where the new president not only has homosexuals in his cabinet, but has transgender people in his cabinet. Blatant, open. The, form, the, the present president who goes out of office January the 20th, the present president said he took pride in the world calling him the most pro-homosexual president in American history. I'm not talking about Biden now. I'm talking about Donald Trump. They don't even try to conceal it. Last part of verse 9. Woe to them. Woe is a word of denunciation. May God denounce them, is what he's saying. For they have brought evil on themselves. And here in verse 10, great verse in this dark, gloomy, negative chapter. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. God says not everybody in this apostate culture is apostate. There are righteous people there. And Isaiah, you tell these righteous people. In this apostate culture under judgment. You tell them I know how to keep the righteous from perishing with the wicked. You tell them that even when I go to burn up their culture. That the righteous will be protected under my hand. And will receive the blessings of their righteousness. Say to the righteous. It's going to go well with them even when everybody else is perishing. Now, what's a righteous person? Is a righteous person somebody that seeks to bring his life into conformity to the law of God so he can make a bunch of points with God? No. A righteous person is somebody whom God declares righteous through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ has credited his righteousness to that believer. And now having been justified by grace through faith alone, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life. Not perfect, but a righteous life. And you tell people, uh, uh, God says to Isaiah, you tell people, small minority, you tell them that when I go to judge in their culture, I'll stand by them. And I'll be their shield. But verse 11 Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with him. Understatement. For what he deserves will be done to him. He's going to get what is evil to deserve. Now, what's a wicked person? A wicked person, a per pervert, and a serial killer. A wicked person is somebody who will not govern his life by the word of God. Verse 12, you can feel the pain in Isaiah's heart. Oh, my people. Their oppressors are children and women. They rule over them. What's the sign of God's judgment? The oppression of irresponsible men in places of power and women in places of political and ecclesiastical power. I have about 2,500 sermons on sermon audio. The one that has gotten by far the most hits to a couple thousand is my sermon, Women Civil Magistrates. So be sure to listen to it. I didn't write this third chapter, by the way. 
How do you know that God's judging America? It has irresponsible men and women. It doesn't say the women are irresponsible. Just women. Irresponsible men and women in places of power and authority in church and state. Oh, my people. Those who guide you in church and state lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. You don't even know what way to walk in. The old paths they confuse, they erase. You're lost. You're like sheep without a shepherd. One of the saddest things I saw this week was a young man that was uh, in the Capitol, one of the people that broke through, the, was let in the Capitol where he shouldn't have been. And uh, he said, and I love Jesus. And uh, I believe that I've been forgiven because of his shed blood on the cross. And I'm a Christian. But what else is there to do? What are we to do? Now, that was a st statement of sheer hopelessness. Where do I go? Nobody's teaching me. Nobody showed me the old paths. I'm all confused about the paths. No, no preacher, no politicians guiding me in the way to go. I'm astray. I'm hopeless. I, I want to go in the right way. I don't know how. I don't know if there is any way out of here. What do we do now? That's like some people read the psalm that we sang this morning. When their foundations are removed, what do the righteous do? How many sermons have I heard on that verse that were hopeless? When the foundations of a nation are, are destroyed, what does the righteous do? Oh, woe is me, nothing. As if that's the answer to the question. But there's the rest of the psalm. That's the first verse. It says, when the foundations are destroyed, what should the righteous do? And the rest of the psalm says, a lot. There's various, the many things the righteous can do. And the first is restoring the foundations. Don't let the uh, bad guys make you feel hopeless. There is a righteous minority in this country. And the future of this country is going to be largely in their hands, so to speak. What they do. Are we going to mourn over the condition of our country? I didn't say complain. I'm tired of even good guys complaining on television. They complain. Don't have any, and the solutions are so naive. One guy whom I respect said, the only hope for America, it's so terrible, they're not mourning, they're complaining, is we've got, the Republican Party's got to wake up. <sighs> to what? What does he mean when he says, the Republican Party's got to wake up, maybe this will wake up the Republican Party. Well, all I can figure is, one, two things. Wake up to its roots and get back to what it was created to be. By Abraham Lincoln, who's responsible for the death of tens upon tens of thousands of northerners and southerners, won't work. Or they say, well, we've got to awaken the Republican Party by getting back to the Constitution. You know uh, what our founding fathers said about the Constitution? They said it's great but it only works among a Christian people. The Constitution without a Christian people can be manipulated in the hands of its enemies. And then on the other hand, you, you have the, 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 the uh, socialists and their evil solutions. We've got to unite now. We've got to unite and reconcile. Now, when they say that, they mean the Republicans and the Democrats got to quit fighting and they got to unite. Be reconciled. Everything's over. Guess what? Most of the Republicans and all the Democrats are reconciled. I mean, they're united in their rebellion against God. 
But at the deepest level, unity in this country is impossible as long as the war is between anti-Christianity and Christianity. And understand that's what they say, mean when they say we want unity. We want the Christians to unite with us. And what they mean is, we want the Christians to unite with the anti-Christians so the anti-Christians can dominate and the Christians can be the water boys. We can't unite at the cost of selling out our religion, our worldview, our heritage, our Lord and Savior. What communion does light have with darkness? There is unity in this life, but it's only found in Christ. It's when all the enemies of Christ surrender and repent of their sins and turn to him. Then we have unity. I've got to hurry. Verse 13. The Lord arises to contend, to fight. And the Lord stands up to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. What is he saying? He's saying, the Lord, there's, there's coming a time in Judah, coming a time in America, when if it continues, it's uh, apostasy unabated, that God's going to say to America, I, enough is enough. That's it. I've been patient. I've seen your preacher after preacher throughout all these years. You haven't, you haven't accepted me. Enough's enough. I'm standing up to fight against you. You don't want God against you. Who is he fighting? The Lord is into judgment with the elders and the princes, the leaders in church and state and family who haven't been faithful to him. God says, I'm going to fight you. I've had enough of your apostasy. And I'm ending your country. Now, one thing people do not do is they do not always notice to whom things are spoken in the scriptures. So you notice the pronouns change. Let's start with verse 13 again. The Lord arises to contend, stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. God's talking to the elders and the princes. He's not talking to the average man on the street. <clears throat> to the elders and princes says, you have plundered the vineyard. Isaiah 5, the vineyard is a symbol of the church. And so he looks at the people in places of power. Says, you have devoured my people, the church. The plunder of my poor people is in your houses. You've taxed them. You're rich. They have to fight and struggle to live. What do you elders and princes mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor? Declares the Lord God of hosts. What's a host? It's all the energies of creation and all the angels of heaven. God says, you really want to fight me? You've devoured my people. You're crushing them. And he's looking at the elders and the princes. He's, those are the ones he's after. So what's the solution? What's the only hope? Let me just read and we'll make a few comments and go home. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Here's the solution. Here's how the problems are solved. 
God says to those that are rebelling against him, including all these preachers and politicians, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Now, don't misunderstand that verse. God's not saying, okay, all you preachers and elders and uh, politicians that are rebelling against me, let's sit down together in a little give and take conversation. And let's reason together. You give me your reasons for the choosing the course you want. I'll give you my reasons for choosing the course I want. And let's try to work out something. That's not what it means when one of the two parties is superior and the other is inferior. When one is the eternal sovereign God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. He's saying to these elders and these princes, Surrender your reason to me. There will be no hope for your nation unless you surrender your reason to me and think and live in terms of my law. No hope out outside of that. Come now, let us reason together, says the sovereign Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. You surrender your mind and will and heart to me. And I'll forgive you of all your sins. I'll even forgive you for murdering 16 million unborn babies. That is grace. America will not survive God's judgment if it does not repent of that one sin. God says, if you do, after murdering 60 million babies, if you surrender your reason and life to me, I'll even forgive you that. Verse 19, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But, if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken to America. Nothing to be depressed about. Don't think this is the end of the world. It is not the end of the world. There are dark days coming, but by God's grace, the righteous will prevail. If we reason together with him. I pray that you'll be one of those people. Quit taking your words from the world. Quit defining your words in terms of the world. Quit voting the way the world wants you to vote. Quit supporting the people that aren't supporting God. Make sure that in everything you do, you think like a Christian and not like all the other anti-Christians around you. Whatever your family does to you, whatever your friends say about you, Martin Luther said in his great hymn, sometimes we have to let goods and kindred go to stand for Christ. You willing to do that? You willing to give up family and friends? To stand for Christ in this evil culture, that's what it's going to take. Some of us are going to be fed to the lions, whatever that means in the 21st century. But you remember, Rome is just a bunch of ruins in Italy. And the Christian church is flourishing to this day 2,000 years later. Let us pray. We think of what I, I Hosea told us, Lord, where you said through him that you gave us a king in your anger and you removed him in your wrath. That you set up people in places of power and you removed them. And during everything that's happening that looks so confused, you are the sovereign God, so that whatever happens the rest of this season, it will be your blessed hand. 
The king's heart is in your hand like a channel of water. You turn it wherever you want. Lord, help us to believe that. Be motivated by it. May we not go back to sleep. May we not think it's somebody else's uh, responsibility. But knowing what we know about this apostate culture, let us do. God, give us the strength and the motivation to do everything we can to retrieve it. And may what we do be in accordance with your word. For Christ's sake, amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the living God. Confess this before the world. It's easy here in church. But confess this before the world as well. Let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.